everyone to the Zorich Podcast, Conversations with Leaders and Legends. I am Chris Zorich, and on today's show, we have a very special guest. He is a recruiting legend. He's considered the godfather of college football recruiting, host of the Lemon Report on CBS Sports Network, an actor, and started his career off, if I'm not mistaken, doing high school sports for the Daily South Town? Is that correct? Yeah, boy, you, you have a great memory, too, because well, uh, it, it, you were It's all about the research. It's all about the research. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Tom Lemmy, thank you so much for being on the show. I appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure, Chris. Good to talk to you again. I haven't seen you in a while. This is going to be amazing. We're, we're going to talk. We're actually going to take a trip down memory lane a little bit. But um, for those of us or – for those of our listeners who may not understand kind of what the whole process of recruiting is, could you give us like maybe a, a, a three minute spiel on kind of what the, the process is? Cause we have a lot of folks who are fans, but may not understand kind of the whole process about college, college recruiting. Well, as far as I'm concerned, it started, I was in my early twenties and I was looking for something to do. I had actually just come back traveling around the world. I'd been in, I was in the Kremlin in Moscow for a couple of months. I was in the pyramids in Egypt. And I wow. thought I wanted to become someone who was a scout for the Chicago Cubs. But okay. uh, as always, there was a lot of nepotism involved. I went there. I remember one time <laughs> spending a whole day waiting in the lobby to talk to uh, an exec, say, hey, I'll start cleaning the bathrooms or whatever you want me to do. And then finally, the second day I came back, I was very persistent. And Vitey Hemsel, who was one of their rotating coaches back in the 60s, I think, Okay. Came and they just had him as an upstairs job. And he came down and he said, hey, you're wasting your time. Uh, there's nobody here that's going to hire. So I was dejected. But I, I was working as a stringer for the South Town Economist doing games for like $5, watching a game, reporting on it, doing those little thumbnail sketches that you do for the newspaper. And um, they give you $5. But what I realized, this is 1978, what I was realizing that people were asking me not about who won the game, St. Rita or Mount Carmel, but where are the players, Mark Savagnin and some of these other guys going to? And I realized there was no national guy doing recruiting. That only, everything local in Chicago, there was the really? legend Taylor Bell. You remember right. Taylor Bell? Right. He would write only about Illinois or Chicago area kids. I'd go out to Los Angeles, Dallas. They only, all, there was always guys just writing locally. So I wanted, and I had the idea of maybe traveling around the country. I loved travel, obviously, traveling around the world and adding um, – travel and history and and football together. And that started it. But I had no money. I really didn't have a design. I just know I had a desire to do it. I had a great work <laughs> ethic. So I took off. Back then, there were no cell phones. You had to go to pay. Here's the thing, too. If I was calling a coach in Aberdeen, Mississippi, uh, I had to call all of them from my home. Then I'd drive down there. And if they weren't around, I'd go to the pay phone. People nowadays don't even know what pay phones are. You go Seriously? Those phone booths. But back then, I did. I went into the phone booth, and I started um, – would call and if the coach didn't answer, I was kind of out of luck no matter where I was traveling. And oh. back in those days, 78, Dan Marino was one of the first players I interviewed in high school okay. in the fall of 78. John Elway, Eric Dickerson came out of that class and Reggie White the next year, Herschel Walker the next year. And, and so it's slowly but surely, you came along, I think, um, seven or eight years later than that. Mm -hmm. uh, but by that time, I was somewhat established. I was first working this alone, then I'd work as a printer, and then I had to work in the post office just to keep the job going. So it took seven years to make money. And so, wow. but it was, it was a passion I had. And that's why nowadays I tell all the young guys back then I was the only one in it. And now there's hundreds of people in this recruiting business. And I tell them, if you're out there to make and be rich right away and make a lot of money, you're not going to be successful. You've got to have a passion for football, passion for travel, passion for talking to people and sure. And it'll work out. Well, well, Tom, one of the amazing things that I think about that whole story is there were places around the country where folks were doing it, but but nothing nationally. So you yeah. had this idea. And I mean, were, were you the first national re recruiter? Yeah, well, yeah, that was the only one. There was a guy, Joe Terranova, who would rank schools at the end of the year, but he didn't travel. He didn't talk to players. He just ranked. Okay. He would call recruiting coordinators at certain schools and find out who they got. And it was just a guessing game, the ranking. But I was definitely the first guy to do anything nationally for years. I think I still am the only guy that goes around the country 
I travel all 48 states. I'll try to go to Hawaii every three years or so. And I went to Alaska once since, <laughs> but it, it snowed all five days I was there and it was late April. So I said, hey, they don't have players coming out of Alaska. Some basketball, no football players. And so I still travel. I'm still the only guy that actually does that, travel around the country. And I would fly to New York for the TV show, but everywhere else now I would just drive and meet all the top players. And that way you can cover everybody because there's an awful lot of good ball players in small towns, especially in the South. You know, Atlanta has them, so does Miami. But the, the majority of players come from little towns uh, dotted around the entire South. Sure. So – I'm going to talk about kind of your your journey, uh, the the show on CBS Network, everything else, but Sports Network. But I remember a phone call I got, and this was this was eighty six, eighty seven, or something like that. And I remember talking to you, and you were saying, "Yes, you know, this is what I do." And I mean, I had. No idea about college, no idea about recruiting, nothing. And you're like, yeah, I'd like to take your picture at Leo High School. And I was like, oh. and I remember going to my mom saying, mom, there's a guy who wants me to take a picture. He wants to take a picture of me in front of Leo High School. She's like, what is it? What, what, what? So, I mean, not even knowing what that whole process was about, but I remember getting the, after we did it, there was like maybe like a a ten page kind of fold out paper at that point. I, I don't know. That was eighty six. Yeah, it's probably like 20, so, 18, 20 pages. I split okay. up the country in different seven sections. Now the magazine's two hundred eighty pages. Right, but back then, right. I had everything kind of in small, like the Midwest, the East, seven different sections of the. And now I put it all in one book. But you're right and. Um, you, when you were you guys were there, you fill out a questionnaire for me with your stats. You didn't have any offers at the time, but I had, sure. gotten, a tip, I had gotten a tip on you. I don't know if it was from your coach or someone else. And when you came out there, and we talked a little bit about this before, um, I think there was about 12, 13 players there at Leo High School. It started to rain. Everybody drove home, and I drove around the corner, and everybody else had been driven home. You were standing on the corner in the rain waiting for a bus. Yep. So I, I said, hey, don't you? Are you and he said, no, I'm waiting for a bus. So I gave you a ride home and then uh, started talking to your mom an awful lot, Zora, for a long time. And she was a wonderful lady. Also had a lot of great stories about you and uh, growing up. You told me some of your stories. too. I remember you at that time had somewhat of a pronounced stutter, which right. you got rid of. Right. But right. you were a bit and you were also, I thought, a military kid because you were so polite. Um, no one was that polite. I wasn't that much older than I was 10 years older than you. Sure. But, but um, most kids didn't have, yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. You thanked me for every single little thing and all that. And no one else had ever done that before that too. Most of the kids, especially the big names thought, uh, you know, and there were good ones from your class. Kent Graham right. was a good kid, but you know, he, he had grown up with his older brothers being recruited. These right. guys were sort of used to it. You were, you were sort of a novice when it came to recruiting and, I remember calling Bob Kamel at Northwestern and Solomon in <laughs> Illinois to talk about you. But the thing was, and let me give you this story, because this is, I think I've told you this, but you were such a good kid and you told me you liked Notre Dame and all that. So I called up Notre Dame and especially Vinny Serrato and I told him all that, hey, there's a kid at CVS, you got to look at him. But the guy I mainly talked to was a guy named Kurt Schottenheimer, who did not want to hear anything about you because he was entranced. He was so in love with this kid, Eric Anderson from uh, the North Shore. <sighs> And it was um, Joe Allen, Kent Graham, and Eric Anderson were the three. And I kept calling him. He says, what about the kid at CBS? He goes, stop talking. He goes, yeah, we'll look at him later. We'll look at him later. But then there was one day left. And it shows you how providence happens, especially if you go to Notre Dame. Because one day left in May to come and see you, or else they wouldn't have had you on the board at all. Holtz calls me and says, hey, I want to tell you, this guy from Sports Illustrated is doing a story on, on you, I mean, on, on me, named Doug Looney. He says, I don't like this guy, Tom, and he always misquotes me. I want to tell you exactly what I said about you and everything else. And he goes on and on. I said, well, thanks, Coach, for warning me. I said, but hey, there's one thing I want to tell you. There's a kid at CBS that I told you guys for two months to go and see, and they wouldn't go see. So um, Holtz goes, and with that, when he's calm, he talks like that whisper almost. I'll take care of it, Tom, like that. So I get a call the next day from Vinny Serrato saying, hey, did you tell the man we were going to see that kid at CBS? He goes, He's yelling at us all saying we're lazy, we're bums, or this and that. So Tony Yelovich was actually the guy that went and saw you because Schottenheimer wouldn't do it. 
So Yelovich got you. They put you now. You're on the list, but not really a priority right. as a linebacker. And then as it progressed and it progressed, the best thing that happened to you was that Eric Anderson went to Michigan and Notre Dame started. Because then you got offers. I remember UCLA, Illinois, um, uh, Northwestern offered you. And then because of that, and I kept pestering Holtz to offer you, and they finally did. Schottenheimer still said, so I'm washing my hands of it. And then um, that's how you actually wound up in Notre Dame. Seriously. And that story, and Tom, you told me that story. And it's amazing because, I mean, I absolutely had no clue. Yeah, and, well, yeah how could you? But the, the idea that they were looking at someone else, and I remember there was a guy named Brian Wagner, as yeah, well, yeah, Brian Wagner. Uh, I think from Buffalo Grove or something exactly, like that. Exactly, yeah. See, you remember um, the names too. Well, but these are all people that were like above me, right? And at the you time, know, you were at the bottom because no one knew who you were. And the, the, public the film, school from CVS. You're playing linebacker. You're at Dick Butkus's school and Keena Turner's school, but in between Keena Turner and you, there was nothing. Nobody. <laughs> so everybody had forgotten about CBS. You know, matter of fact, I picked the Butkus Award now for Dick Butkus. Oh, it's great. And a high school linebacker. So I'll meet with him out, and he lives out in Malibu. And what a wonderful guy. And I tell him about you and about Keena Turner. He used to come to my house to watch film when he was a coach at Stanford. And CBS, Ernie McMillan, you guys have had a great track record of your high school. And it's right. been a while now since someone uh, – I think the Williams kid, the quarterback down at Illinois, came mm -hmm. from the school. Yep. Williams. Yep. Yep. But since then, it's been a little dry. But that was right. the whole story. Schottenheimer didn't dislike you. He was just so enamored with Eric Anderson at a linebacker that that's all he talked about. So whenever he'd call me, he would always talk about him. What about Graham? Are they going to get Graham? Are they going to get Allen? Are they going to get – and then I would say, what about Zorch? And he goes – we got him on a list. We're looking at him. We're wow. the, and eventually they offered you, and the rest is history. You became the best of the whole bunch. Well, you know, it, it's so interesting because when folks think about, like, hey, what what's the process for recruiting? My kid this, my kid that. And I'm sure you've had tons of phone calls from parents. I mean, I can't even imagine, right? Probably posing as coaches or whatever, right? <laughs> but the idea that, I mean, so – Kind of talk about your role kind of in that process. There's coaches who have to go out and see that they have certain certain territories. They have to see, I mean, are you making it easier for them? Or do, do they hear about someone and say, hey, Tom, what do you think about this? Or, or is it a relationship you have with the schools? I mean, obviously, you have to stay apart. Yeah, I talked to most of the top schools nationally and I'm just one of, uh, for them, because they do their own work now. Now they've now it's a lot different than when you were coming out. Schools like Alabama, I think, have 20-something people behind the scenes recruiting. So they do their own work. They get all their stuff. But I think some guys like Nick Saban, Urban Meyer, Pete Carroll, Mac Brown, I just was with Mac filming for my show, um, they still want to pick my brain because they're smart guys. They realize he may not know what he's talking about, but there might be a little gem that let me know is that we could use later down the line. The uh, arrogant coaches don't last very long. And there's been quite a few of them that, and not that I'm any genius about it, but I right. do travel. I'm the guy nationally, the only person in the whole country that sees everybody in person. So I do pick up the little tidbits here, not just about their ability, or about, but maybe the, who's going to make the decision. With you, it was only you and your mom, but there's a lot of people, maybe the coach, maybe the uncle. Now now they've got these AAU coaches like they do in basketball. they got right. football. Who's going to be the guy? And I always make sure I know who the guy is going to help him. So I do have the – and Mac Brown is smart enough to come when I spent time when he kept asking me about a ton of the ball players, And it's just smart. Not that uh, – like I said, I'm not a, a genius on the recruiting angle, but I do see the players more than anybody else in the country. And so – but there's some coaches that say, we're going to rely on our own guys. We don't want to talk right. to this. And then I'll give those pretty good tidbits to someone else to help people so that doesn't talk. <laughs> Well, and, and that's kind of interesting because it's almost like you have kind of an understanding of kind of what the personality is of the recruit and how they would fit somewhere, right? So I think during my process, and I don't want to talk about me the whole show, but during the process, for me, it was basically down to Northwestern and Notre Dame. And it's almost like you were you were kind of aware of that. Even though I had, I, I mean, Michigan was on that list and also Illinois, but I mean, do you get a sense of kind of what, for just some conversation with the kids and the parents, family or whatever, 
of where someone would fit. I mean, okay, maybe I wouldn't be a good fit at Washington or something like that. Well, you would have been a good fit at Notre Dame and Northwestern. So if you had asked me, I probably would have said, because, you know, you're looking towards the academics. Like I said, you sounded like you had a military background. You were so polite and you were a guy that fits into those schools. Some guys don't fit into the academic right. schools. Some guys are just there looking to get to the NFL, not worried about academics. So they want the easiest course load possible. They don't want to graduate. They want to get to the NFL. So right. uh, you were one that, you know, looked for both at a, at a young age and, yeah, and you were such a good kid that and I call you kid then because you were. To me, you're still a kid. That's funny. And, and, uh, but you were such a good kid. It was easy. And the year before you, there was another kid that came out of Chicago just like you. And you know him, John Foley. Yes. <laughs> Foley Go Foley. Had, he was a little different, but he was also such a nice – he was a good kid. Great almost guy. childlike at the time. Great guy. But uh, here's a good story. There was a coach at South Carolina named Tom Cruise who worked for Joe Morrison, who had been a big NFL star. Okay. Joe used to call me and say, Tom, I'm sending Tom Cruise over to see you. And, he, and Tom, I sent him out to St. Rita where they were running wind sprints, 40 yards. Foley, remember, used to say, I could run a 4.5, I could run a 4.5, and he was big. He was fast. So they were running because it was raining. They didn't run it in St. Rita Stadium. They ran it on the cement outside. And Cruz goes, I'm taping him. And he goes, I ran a 4.55, 4.56. Foley goes, I got to break 4.5. And he, the third time he ran and he dove on cement. And I'm, he came up all bloodied arm in his face. I said to Cruz, what did, did he break four or five? He goes, I could care less. He goes, anybody that's going to go dive on some. I want that guy. That's someone we want in South Carolina. Oh, that's amazing. So I'm sure, stories. you know, there's, there's thousands of, of stories like that, but it, it really just kind of shows kind of your uh, um, understanding of the players, the, the dedication that you have, because uh, – a lot of these, it's my understanding, a lot of these guys, as you said, you know, they're they're sitting at home. Um, they may even be reading kind of what you're putting out, but they're they're sitting at home kind of review, reviewing everything on their own versus you going out and actually talking to people. Yeah, I think what the, most of them do is because they, um, they'll they talk on the phone, call the player, and a lot of the rankings. I kind of I did these rankings myself, and they're all bogus, five-star, four. You know, really what I did, what, which happened with the star system, I was sitting with Gil Brandt. Mike Godfrey was my partner on ESPN for years. Okay. And um, as a matter of fact, you played against Mike when he was head coach at Pitt. Yeah, yeah. And um, so Mike would have this large banquet for his daughter who was mentally challenged. Okay. And, and, and Mobile, we did it for seven years. It was Paul Feinbaum, um, Tim Brando, wow. Gil, Gil Brandt. And Kenny Stabler, and we were the speakers. So I always sat next to uh, Stabler and Brent. Gil Brent, when I, he, the most famous scout of all time. He started when the Cowboys became a team in 1960, and he's in the Hall of Fame as a scout. He says, Tom, in the NFL, we used eight stars. I'm thinking, okay, eight stars. I'll start doing that. I confused everyone. Eight stars, eight stars. <laughs> Nobody think at all. So then I'm thinking, everybody goes, what is this, eight stars? What does two star mean, that I'm no good or something? Right, so right. then the next year, I went to two stars for a couple of years, which meant division one star is division one, two star means you're an All-American. That's okay. not enough. And I, was staying, I always stay at these Holiday Inn Expresses where they rank the hotels, five star, four star, three star. That's how simple it came down. I was using wow. the hotel system. Wow. And I had some guys, Barry Sanders came in the booth when I was with uh, NBC for the U.S. Army game. And. He said to me, do you remember who I am? Because I didn't give him a good, a good rating. Wow, right, you were, right. You remember Mike Allstad, who came out of Chicago. Yeah, yeah. Mike went to play for Tampa Bay. Uh, my son, after I got divorced, my son moved down to Tampa Bay with my wife. And he sat on the radio. He goes, Dad, I heard on a radio show, Mike also was bad-mouthing and saying, I use Tom Lemmy and his motivation because he said I'd never be a tailback. <laughs> So I ran into Mike a couple of years ago. He's coaching down in St. Petersburg. And I said, Mike, I heard he go, oh, Tommy, I just use that for motivation. I said, you know, I never said tailback. I never said one back. You just wouldn't be a tailback. <laughs> right, exactly. exactly. And one good story with, with Peyton Manning. I was, um, I and my son were walking into, I'm Buddy Tevens, used to be head coach at Stamper. Now he's right. over at Dartmouth. Buddy and I are walking in because Buddy helps run the uh, Archie Manning camp down in Hammond, Louisiana. Okay. So I'm walking in with my son and in the cafeteria was just Peyton and his dad. I hadn't seen Peyton in 10 years. So I come and say, hey, guys, how's it going? And Peyton goes, hey, hey, Tom, how's your buddy Josh Booty doing? And this is the reason. In 1991, they were my two players of the year, but I gave Josh Booty the USA Today National Player of the Year. And wow. Peyton was second team. And he still remembered that. They're both from Louisiana. Wow. He had a chip on his shoulder. And I, I'm thinking, I says, come on. I says, you're all pro with the Colts now. Can't you get over that? And the reason was Booty 
wound up going with the Florida Marlins. He signed for, I think, $3 million in the first okay. round. Made the majors, but didn't do well. And then he went back six years later or five years later as the LSU starting quarterback as a 23-year-old freshman. But wow. Peyton, I think that's what made Peyton so great. He had that chip on his shoulder, which uh, you you would know all about that because you had a chip. Uh, but you were like the nicest guy off the field, and you are a Tasmanian devil when you played. Well, you know, it's so funny because you mentioned – kind of me saying yes or no, sir, that came from a high school coach, John Pataki, because he would, I mean, he literally thrived on discipline. If we weren't, um, I'll just kind of tell a funny story from him. We, we always had to wear a helmet because he had, a, he had the mantra of, you know, you are, you, you always wear your helmet um, during war and this is war. Right. Sure. So, I get to Notre Dame, and I mean, I, I have my helmet on, and it's strapped up. I mean, it, it's, it's I'm sitting ready to go. I'm not even playing. I'm on the side. They're like, Chris, it's like 90 degrees. Take your helmet off. I'm like, are you kidding me, man? I'm not even going. This is war. But it was just kind of that that mentality. And another story about my coach. Um, he talked about how I had this this anger. And I needed to kind of get out some, some of this aggression. Yeah. And he mentioned that to one of the reporters and it was in the paper. And I remember my mom, she was so unhappy about that because she's like, you're not, I mean, I love you. You know, you're a wonderful son, blah, blah, blah. I don't know what your coach. So like the next time she saw him, she's like, you know, my son is, she gave him the finger. But it was interesting because I came from such a different environment going to um, Notre Dame. And I'm not sure if they were used to people like me, but I mean, <laughs> I was like, I went 100%. Um, you know, yes or no, sir. I got into fights. I mean, I'm not, yeah. not going to lie about that. But I was taught like this aggressive style of football. And, you know, if that meant, you know, now granted, I got kicked out of a couple of practices, but it was so interesting because I, 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 I believe I did have this anger. And I was able to kind of take it out on the field. And I kind of, I mean, Holtz was able to kind of notice that and able to kind of harness it. Well, I, you're sort of an enigma right from that start because I do remember Lindsey Knapp telling me that you and him would get into the fights or stuff. And Lindsey talking about, you know, Chris was such a guy, good guy off the field. I remember you as a freshman. Your mom called me a couple of times and asked if I'd call you because you were crying. You wanted to come home. Absolutely. So I go, so that is an enigma. Here you are crying, and all of a sudden you're going beating everybody up when you get on the practice I mean, field. Tom, there was a time, and I, I mean, I remember this exactly. It was after my first semester. I was I got put on academic probation because my grades were so bad. I mean, again, went to Chicago vocational high school. I mean, it was tough. And public school trying to adapt to, to Notre Dame was a challenge. But I remember having this conversation with my mom and I was crying. I was like, I'm coming home. She's like, absolutely not. And so, I mean, I remember those phone calls of folks. I mean, she got you, she got my high school coach. She got a whole bunch of people, you know, trying to encourage me to kind of stay there. And obviously, you know, it's kind of going through growing pain. Miss my mom, you know, things like that. But it's kind of so interesting. I think that how, you're able to kind of get involved in players' lives and to see someone after 30 years, you know, Peyton Manning, he's like, hey, what about, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's funny because, it, again, it just shows that how much you care and how much respect you have within the industry because, I mean, you know, you're out there knocking on doors, talking to parents, talking to kids, talking to coaches, and really getting an understanding of kind of how these kids would react to something or kind of what, what the best fit is for these kids. Yeah, you know, I enjoy it. And then I never, like, I've never charged a player any money for anything because that's what some of the guys were in the business for. I always, uh, I made my money with the colleges and the fans subscribing to mm -hmm. the magazines and all. And um, I always felt an obligation uh, if one of them called me and asked to talk or find out. I, I try, like you said, you can't steer them to a certain school. I always say go for the academics, which you normally put Notre Dame, Stanford, Northwestern, Boston College, Rice, Duke, uh, and Vanderbilt up in the forefront when you talk about it. Because I do remember one coach back then was from Florida State because I always seemed to have run-ins with him. And I said, uh, I, I said, no, I, I, he says, you got to stop pushing kids in Notre Dame or Stanford. And, and, and I said, no, I'm not pushing them. I just tell them to go to academics. He goes, well, that hurts us. <laughs> Bobby Bowden, God bless his soul, was uh, oh my gosh. there, and he was uh, 
they they had some guy and actually one of my first subscribers in my magazine was Burt Reynolds and I kept his check and I still I still kept kept all the things he filled wow. out and, I, and then when I started doing uh, sports channel throughout the 90s which was uh, an ESPN but also around Chicago uh -huh. around the whole country uh, my co-host Gene Deckeroff is good friends of Burt Reynolds because he was, he does the Florida State Seminoles and the Tampa Bay Bucks so I got to meet Burt down there and he he played he played football. With him and Lee Corso were right. I know roommates, which is hard to because Lee's That's still crazy. going. That's crazy. And uh, Bert was a pretty good ball player coming to high school. He tore up his knees quickly within two years. I think had two or three knee operations. So uh, then he went into acting. But he was uh, upset with uh, if I said anything negative about Florida State, <laughs> and he would punch you in the shoulder. So he always had a lot to it, Bert. But a good guy. You are listening to the Zorch podcast with our guest Tom Lemming. Um, the idea of trying to do the, the best you can, and I'm sure there have been times when you've kind of you misjudged somebody, somebody have talent. Uh, and I'm not looking for any names, but when something like that occurs, like how do you feel about that? Or I mean, is it something where you know the coaches are on you? Or you're like, you know, I, I don't know what happened. I mean, how do you handle that? Well, I've made a lot of mistakes. You know, I deal with a couple thousand guys a year, so there's been a lot of them. I told you to start Barry Sanders coming into booth right. and saying, hey, do you remember me? Because I think <laughs> I had him. Because Barry, I think, was injury prone, small little back from Wichita, Kansas. But I never say anything negative about anybody. If you read my magazines, you can tell who the better players are by the ones I put first and with five sure. stars, four stars, three stars, and right. then the other ones. But I'll always say something positive about every single person that's in the magazine because we're not dealing with professionals. We're dealing with high school ball players that, and their career could be on the line. So I always say something positive about it. Could be a five foot nine nose guard, but I'll say, hey, this guy can hit, he can run. And <laughs> right, obviously, right. they got him in the wrong position, but I won't say that. It's up to the their high school coach to. Put him in the right position. Put him in a position, perhaps if he could run, maybe put him as a strong safety or something. Sure. But there's there's so much of that going on in high school ball, and I can understand the parents' grief when they look like they might have a great athlete, but they're out of position or so. So I try to help them that way. And sometimes I've actually called the coaches about. It. I say, Coach, and you got to do it in a diplomatic way, or else coaches go, "Who's this guy butting into my program?" Right. right. So what I'll say is, Coach, I said this. Well, you're doing a great job, Coach. You're fantastic. You're zero and nine, but boy, you guys are. <laughs> I said, but I, I like this kid a lot. You ever think of maybe putting him at free safety or something, or uh, you know? And sometimes the coaches will take the hint, and sure. every now and then they get mad at me or something. You know, mind your own business. But you, you try to put him, and and they're thinking about winning games. I'm thinking about helping right. the ball player get a right. full ride, so his parents don't have to pay for his college education. So, Tom, where do you think you got this talent from? I mean. The idea that you're you were kind of, you know, I mean, taking stats, high school stats for, for the, uh, the the South Town Economist. I mean, how do you go from there to being on television talking about? It? I mean, getting paid. To do oh, this. sort of like Mel Kuyper, and I know I know Mel, and we started almost around the same time, where I was the only one doing it for a long right. time, and okay. then yeah, first I got picked up by. Um, USA Today, when they came into existence in 1982, so I've been picking their team ever since. Okay. And then, um, ever since, you know, from 82 up to until the, now I don't even know if they're a newspaper anymore. But <laughs> right, right, exactly. Out. And then uh, ESPN picked me up in the 80s. Um, every, and slowly but surely, the U.S. Army game, when it first came into existence, I was there on the ground floor picking the team and doing the broadcast with NBC people. And uh, I was always sort of innovative. I wasn't it wasn't any genius or anything. It was just being someone who had a passion, which works more than passion and hard work work more, I think, than being brilliant at something. I think I agree. if you have I that, you, you have that desire. I had the desire. I was a, uh, a child of a, a father who uh, fought in World War II and got shot, got a shrapnel wound by the Nazis, didn't like to travel after that because he drove a munitions truck. I'm, wow. I'm lucky to be here. <laughs> so we never took a family vacation. So mm -hmm. I never traveled. So my dream, I'd sit around dreaming about going to places like Washington, D.C. with sure. with all, you know, the, and, and museums and, and New York and Philadelphia and all the history. And that's why I took off when I was 18 and started traveling around the world. And now I could include this in my job, which would be traveling around America. I write 30 pages every year on my travels and talk about some historic sites. As a matter of fact, the front cover of this magazine came out this month is the Martin Luther King Memorial. I had all the kids mm. in the DMV 
um, which is um, D.C., Virginia, and Maryland, mm -hmm. meet, and they posed in front of the, the statue at wow. 8 o'clock in the morning one Sunday morning. It worked out perfect, and that's the front cover. And I just love history about everything. And, uh, and, and, and you know, even I've been doing this 42 years. I still enjoy doing it, and I love travel. I can't wait to take my next trip. Wow, that is that is absolutely amazing. Well, and kind of on those lines, I mean, do you, do you have parents kind of calling you and saying that hey, or not so much you didn't rate my kid high enough, but hey, my kid like he needs something, or you know, have you thought about you know, have you? And again, not saying that that you're they're going to influence you, but I mean, have you had parents call? Yeah, they call all the time. Most of the time, it's parents of players who aren't that good. Okay. But you, but possibly lower Division One or Division Two or right. NAIA, they could possibly be there. So I always try to send them in the right direction. As soon as you see them, it, you know, you would know the same thing. If you got a guy like I mentioned, a five nine nose guard, or you've got a uh, wide receiver runs a four eight, mm -hmm. they're not going to be Division One no right. matter what. You got to have the size and the speed that fits into that particular. Position. I mean, there's examples. You could get Deshaun Jackson was probably like five nine, ran a four three. So obviously, right. he was going to be a good wide receiver, right. no matter even if he wasn't six foot. But for the most part, you got to have coaches aren't going to look at you if you don't fit into what they believe uh, the size and the speed that would fit into that same position. So I try to direct him in the right direction. And every now and then you get you get coaches calling you. Can you help this kid? I just got one today asking me to help this kid in Florida, who I like a quarterback who's off to a great start, no offers. Well, Western Carolina offered him. I believe he can play in the SEC. He's that good. Mm. So we're going to start promoting him. And the same thing happened. The reason how I found uh, Michael Orr from the Blindside movie mm -hmm. was it's uh, different than what the movie had. Us. The book is right. Uh, you Freeze, who's now at Liberty, he used to be the old man. He was a high right. school coach. Right. He had called me. He had seen I was with uh, my last year at ESPN 2004. They used to have a car with my head on it and move it along the Internet. Okay. Said, okay, Tom's going to be in St. Louis today. Right. And I saw that I was going to be coming to Memphis. He goes, Tom, you got to I got this kid who's never played football, but he's 6'5", 250, running a 4'8". I go, I say, Coach, if he's 6'5", 350, running a 4'8", you're not going to need my help. But I, don't <laughs> believe, but I didn't believe him. So he sent a, an old grainy tape. That, and the kid going through the, the rope drill looked like Barishnikov. I go, oh. he can't be that big as you say. Nobody moves that well. Wow. And then um, I actually got there and. Um, Clay Helton, who's now the head coach of USC, mm -hmm. opened the doors for me at Memphis. He was the recruiting coordinator uh, 17 years ago. And so Clay says, hey, Tom, we wish you weren't coming here because they had the kids meet me at Memphis. He goes, I wish you weren't coming here because we're the only people that know about this kid. And, wow. And I figured I had a big mouth. I was going to, and I was. Because <laughs> the very next day after I met Michael, uh, I put it on ESPN that I just saw the best tackle in the country and he hasn't played football yet. So wow. that immediately blew everything up. It was a couple of months before coaches were allowed to travel. But as sure. soon as that happened, everyone came to Memphis mm. to see the kid. And that's mm. how this story got going. But for every Michael Lohr, there's a couple of hundred kids that don't have that kind of talent sure. that need to kind of maybe think a little bit lower. As long as you're playing football and all of a sudden maybe you grow and get faster when you get to college, you could be in Harvard or Yale or an NIA right. school. You know, um, uh, there's some players at these Division three schools. Uh, Don Beebe, I don't know if you know Don. Don's from Chicago. Right. He was the second fastest guy in the NFL for like nine straight years. Yeah. Yeah. He went to a Division three school and he played one game. But they found him at a combine. They saw him and he ran a 4-3. It was <sighs> flat. And that's how he wound up playing 11 years in the NFL. So they'll find you. The NFL does a pretty good job of scouting. So no matter where you go in college, as long as you're playing and having fun, they're going to find you. So what advice would you have for a parent who actually came to the realization that, hey, my kid isn't going to be um, the, the, the big star player, which is hard for parents, right? I mean, I'm a parent now, and, yeah. and, and you think everybody, hey, my child walks on water. He's the, he or she is the best player in, in the country. Um, but what advice would you have for someone maybe who's not being recruited as much as the parents think they should be, have a, have a conversation with the kid, have a conversation with themselves, and say, you know, hey, this might not be it. Where, what are the next steps? You know, you know, the high school coach has to be very diplomatic. You don't want to upset, particularly if it's like a quarterback or so, because they're okay. sensitive anyway most of sure. the time. And uh, what they've got to do is talk 
the parents have to go to the high school coach because no matter what I do, I could send them to the school, but they got to go see the high school coach to watch film and meet with them. So their first stop should be talking to the coach and say, where do you believe our son belongs? And, and, and a coach is not going to lie to him. He's, he's had him for four years. He's going to say, Hey, we love your son. He's a great player, but he probably should be a division one, a division two ball or okay. something. Then you got to take him for it. And some parents just don't want to hear that. They think their son's going to be the next Tom Brady. Right. So no matter what they hear, they're not going to listen to the coach. But I say do that. And if you don't like the coach, go to college. If you're in Chicago, go visit Notre Dame or Northwestern or Illinois or Wisconsin and ask for a visit before that. Bring your best game film. Always put the best place first because college coaches have the attention of a five-year-old. <laughs> they're going to only stay for one or two minutes. Sure. They're not going to wait 20 minutes to right. see if something's right. going on after right. that. So send it to – bring the tape. If they like the tape and they see that you fit into what they're looking for, that's it. Go visit schools. And it's a good family vacation, too. You could go off the mom and dad and the son, go visit some schools and during the summer months and go um, uh, talk to the coach. Call ahead. There's so many people on campus now that can show them around. The tape will eventually, usually what schools now, they'll use a graduate assistant looking at film. Right. And it goes to uh, – um, in-house people, then to the assistant coach, uh, and assistant coach likes them, then you've got the scholarship. So when would you say from kind of your journey, when, was it after the seven years we started to make money, or was it like, wow, you know, this is really coming on, like there are other people out here that, that are trying to do it now. I mean, when do you think it kind of took off to where it's at now? I started in the 78, 79 year. A couple of years later was a guy named Max Empfinger who came along, but he mainly did the Southwest. And then around 1985 or so, their Super Prep magazine came up, a guy named Alan Wallace, who he had me do his Midwest. He actually didn't do the stuff. He had other people do the stuff for them. And um, I think he, then what happened was he uh, uh, got people to um, – Right. And then that's so there were three of us going for years. And then okay. finally, with the uh, the advent of the Internet, that's when it brought the hundreds of people along there. And right. that's what happened. Right. Well, OK, um, so kind of going along those lines, I mean, and, and how do you think social media has affected kind of college recruiting? I mean, even now, I mean, I'm on Twitter and, you know, everybody's thanking everybody and, and they're, they're doing their own press conferences and everything. Yeah. I mean, just from your experience and literally kind of starting the industry up until now with social media. Yeah, they, they, they've they had a great influence on it, particularly with the kids, because most kids announce on Twitter now. And then back then, the very first guy to announce on television, at least in my mind, was uh, Ron Paulus, who announced on our show on ESPN wow. okay. in 1992. I had known his coach, George Curry, up in Berwick, Pennsylvania, and Ron was going to be the number one player of 92. And um, we had talked to him and Ron and said, would you announce with us a year later? And it was Mike Godfrey and a guy named Dan Debingham who preceded Chris Fowler at ESPN. Okay. And we had him announce. So Ron was the first guy. And then we had a, every now and then a few guys in the 90s. But then um, when we started the U.S. Army game, it was, again, it was my idea. To, I remembered about Ron Paulus and, NBC was picking up the game from ESPN too. And we said, um, I knew Chris Leak's father and Chris okay. Leak because of his older brother and Curtis Leak said, yeah, we'll have Chris do it a year later. It got to be a jumble. We announced at halftime. And then I remember um, Reggie, Reggie Bush and Lindale White coming up to me saying, we'll announce too. I go, you guys have already announced for USC <laughs> a month ago. So, but we let it, you know, the more the merrier. Some people that didn't know they're already going to USC. And, uh, but Chris had to take five straight visits in one week. And oh. was private planes from Texas, Mac Brown was flying them around, Kirk Ferentz at Iowa, and Ron Zook obviously got him, and Bobby Bob. So after that, that's when they stopped these private planes flying ball oh. players because of okay. uh, all the publicity that had gotten. But that's what happened. And then gradually, um, we, we did it on our CBS show for years until Chantrell Henderson, his dad, wanted a private. Uh, flight because he wasn't getting along with the mom. Chantrell wasn't getting along with them. We had different flights, wow. different hotel rooms. And my executive, because we had Brian Cushing and um, uh, uh, LaShawn McCoy, guys like that announced for us in our studio in New York. Okay. And Greg M. Singer was my co-host first. And then Molly okay. Therum. Molly's now with uh, the first take. Yeah. And yeah. now it's, and then Adam Zucker, we had guys announced. But after a while, our executive producers were getting mad. We're not going to pay for these guys coming. So, after that, it was just guys doing it on Twitter. And uh, if they do it at their high school, 
some people would send cameras there to get them. So that's what okay. most of the kids do now. Wow. That's, that's amazing. I mean, it's amazing to kind of see where, where, it's, where, where it started and kind of where we're at now. And I'm sure eventually, I mean, there were things I was watching somebody, um, you know how they do like a, a, a reveal when, when you have like a baby, either pink or blue. Like somebody yeah. did a reveal like that where it was the color of the school. I mean, it's getting so kind of crazy oh. where all of us old guys are like, dude, just make it, make just, just say something and then stick to it. Like, what the hell? It started that started a little bit with the our, with our game, the U.S. Army, and we used to have a guy, Lewis, who was like six foot six, big guy, stand next to the kid and make sure because the people in the booth were going, kids would reach for one hat, pick it up, put it down and do that a couple of times. And we get the college coaches mad. So Lewis would always, uh, they always asked him one question and then they'd go with the family. Okay. Now it's your time. And he'd reach and Lewis would make sure that hands reaching for the right hat wow. or else grab it and put it up like that. Because some of these kids were just trying, you know, they, right. they, they thought, you know, they're 18 year olds thought they were being funny. They think it's funny. Exactly. And realizing that a lot of people are pretty upset about, especially the fans, especially the coaching staff of the schools he did not go to. Well, you got people's livelihoods on the line, right? I mean, exactly. that's what happens. You know, that's, that's crazy. Exactly. Um, so, so talk a little bit about, you talked about the, the Army All-American game. You were kind of on the ground floor of that. And yeah. Kind of talk yeah, about well, how that started and how, how that helped players. Well, it was uh, Rich McGinnis and uh, Doug Berman, the guys that started it. Really, Rich McGinnis started it. He came to me in 2000. The very first game was in Dallas, and it was a disaster. Um, I would call – I would give him 60 names. Ten said yes. I remember the number one player was Joe Maurer, the Minnesota Twins catcher. He was the number one okay. football player, too. And he said no. A lot of the kids said no. Then we went to another 60. We just needed uh, 80 players. And oh. they, kept, they all kept turning it down. They played in Dallas in a bad weather – Nobody watched it. It was on Fox, and uh, oh. uh, and no one watched it. So then that was it. And then I get a call before 9-11, I think six days before it, and Rich goes, you got to fly down to San Antonio. The Army's going to pick up our game. I said, boy, that's great. So we get down there. We're sitting at the 50-yard line, and it was um, myself, Colonel Nickerson, uh, uh, this guy who was the uh, held a rec rushing record in high school. He was from 10. Nice guy. And it was um, Colonel Boone from Remember the Titans, the real Colonel Boone. Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, Captain and Coach Boone. And okay. um, it had to be like 100 degrees out. I'm wearing a shirt and tie. I'm sweating. And no one's showing up. We invited the nation's press. And only the San Antonio Express guy showed up. And we were there for hours. But during the time, Coach Boone goes, uh, who are you picking? I said, we got some pretty good players. I remember we had Vince Young in that game. And, some, and he said, you're missing the best running back. I said, who is it? He goes, it's J.D. Washington. I go, never heard of him. And he goes, it's Denzel's son, because Denzel had played Coach Boone the year okay, before. Right, right, right. And they were right. friends. I'm thinking, I never heard of the kid, but if we can get Denzel to show up to the game, that's going to get publicity. <laughs> so I remember calling up Denzel in his house and asking him, saying, we'd like to have your son in the game. And he got okay. really excited. And so JD shows up, and, you know, he wasn't an All American, wasn't bad, play, but he's small. Wasn't right. nearly as big as Coach Boone said he was. And, of course. Uh, and he was, he, went, he obviously wasn't All American. So, uh, I don't even know if he was all league out in Los Angeles. And, but and this is the one that's currently an actor, right? Exactly. That's okay, why about okay. two years ago, <laughs> I'm watching Jimmy Kimmel, and he's telling Jimmy Kimmel, I was a high school All-American. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, technically, it, you played in the game, right? He did play a couple of years, but he had minus yards or whatever it was. Wow. He, he was a nice kid, too, very polite and everything, and but he wasn't an All-American. But sure. he, technically, he was. He was in the Army. Army right, Army exactly, so, exactly. He was going out saying, and uh, I remember thinking that. So, and I remember he was kind. Of, he, he was so small for a running back, very small, and uh, and but he fit in with the kids because he was a nice guy, and sure. these were all the all Americans that year. Sure. And, but it was our. That was actually the very first U.S. Army game in January uh, of two thousand and two. Now, since then, there have been multiple games with different sponsors and on different channels. Whatever, yeah, right? the Army pulled out. I left the Army game to help start the Semper Fi game, the Marine game, which okay. pulled out after five years. Now I'm kind of helping with, uh, with the Polynesian game out in Hawaii. Okay. But the Army pulled out, and now it's just a, a whole hodgepodge of, uh, of uh, sponsors trying to keep it going. The under okay. They didn't play any of this because of COVID this right. year. And the under I actually picked the first Under Armour game also. 
Well, I was picking the Army again because wow. uh, the guy who started it, Sean Garrity, who played D-line at Syracuse, is a big businessman. And okay. Sean asked me to pick the players. And I did for both. One year, I picked both teams. And uh, so it was like 220 players total. And they played the game in uh, Disney World at the uh, Wide World of Sports. And, uh, and, and it was sponsored by um, Under Armour. Uh, Disney ESPN two had it on. Okay. They did so well. They stole the game from Sean. He no longer, he, t Sean started the whole thing and they wow. just took it away. Cause I guess he didn't have a contract with him and they've been doing it ever since. And Sean just got booted out, which is shame when someone mm. does something like that and right. gets no right. credit for it. Right. Well, you know, and it's really interesting because I mean, recruiting now has become this huge huge industry now, right? And, and obviously thanks to you, but before, I'm assuming way back when, you know, you were selling your magazines to coaches. Yeah. And now, like, you have a, the general population, you're like buying your magazine now. I mean, what was that like from kind of seeing where recruiting has gone from now coaches? Now you have like literally everyday Joes kind of following yeah, well, fans bought it right from the get-go, but not that many. So you're right, because <laughs> I had to constantly, why do you think I was working other jobs? <laughs> and, uh, I had to keep bouncing around and, and, and working and working, but it was, I had a true love, passion for what I was doing, and right. money didn't mean quite as much back then. I used to sleep in my car every other day when I first started because I didn't <sighs> have uh, money for hotels. So um, sometimes two out of three. Here's a good story. Remember Bob Trumpy? He was the former All-Pro tight end with the Bengals. Yeah, yeah, he had yeah. this national radio show for years. and But it came okay. out of Cincinnati, 50,000 watt. So I would do his, how I sold it, because I didn't have money for advertisement. I'm doing radio shows. Jack Brickhouse and Chuck Swirsky in Chicago. Chuck Kopic, obviously, here. Wow. Frank Beckman in Detroit. Hap Gaudi in New Orleans. And so Bob Trumpy was the very first guys. This is 79 or 80 or 81. I can't remember. But wow. um, I would talk to him on the phone, and I think they all thought I was much older than 25 years old. <laughs> and so I actually went to Cincinnati, figured this is a big 50,000 watt, I get some subscribers. I didn't have money for a hotel, so I slept in my car below the station somewhere a oh couple blocks away. God. I show up and crumple clothes up into the radio booth. Thank goodness there's radio instead of TV. Right, 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 exactly. So when I walked in, Bob Trumpy goes, who's that? I hear him say to somebody, he goes, that's Tom Lovey. That's Tom Lovey. Like, oh my God. Yeah, I could probably look like a baby. Father, probably look like I was 18. Sure. And he's thinking, here's this is the recruiting expert, the guru. Like so. Uh, but you know, Bob was so nice to me and he had me on and he really helped promote uh as well as so many other like Taylor Brown in, in this mm -hmm. uh, Chicago Sun Times and so many radio guys that um that I've known over the years from uh, some of the big cities uh, were always great. Hap, Hap Gaudi was a guy in New Orleans. Who was a, he's a legend down there. He's passed away since then. But okay. throughout the 80s and 90s, I'd always go on during Mardi Gras. And it was always funny because I, I'm right in the middle of something. I say, hey, LSU's going to be there. He goes, Tom, Tom, we got to stop for 20 minutes. We'll come right back to you because the girls are going right behind the floats. <laughs> right out the station window. And he can, he can hear the noise in the body. Oh, my God. That's that. crazy. Every year we did that. He was great. Wow. Wow. Well, <laughs> And, and so I'm going to transition to you, kind of as popular as, it, as as it's gotten now, like, I mean, you have, I mean, you have recruiting fans. I mean, you got, I got people sending me emails, sending me text messages. Hey, have you seen this guy? Have you seen this guy? And I'm like, first of all, I don't know talent that well, but what do I know? And so, but it, it's so funny because it seems like everybody knows what's going on. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, because social media and because these kids, you know, have their own accounts or whatever now, I mean, That's and so it it's, it's almost to the point where, I mean, in some cases, it's making your job easier, but also harder. Yeah, yeah. well, for me, it's I, I'm a one man kind of a band. Most of them, like if you got 247 or Rivals or ESPN or Scout.com and all these, right. they've got 100 people working for them. So that's why I've got to travel the whole country and see everybody. So. It is harder for me to keep track of everybody. I, I don't make a lot of the announcements, thank goodness, because that's where you have to keep track of them. And, right. and I don't depend on the kids making announcements to make money. Uh, when you're on the Internet, the ball players that are uncommitted are the ones that are making the Internet money because fans are still trying to find out what they're going to do. Sure, sure. Once like 
Chris Zorich commits to Notre Dame, everybody forgets about him and so right. going after the guys that are still out there. Right. And that's where all the attention's put on. So the longer uh -huh. they wait, the more money they can make for the internet site. So uh, thank goodness I don't have to do that. I just, um, I'll write about them for the magazine. I'll talk about them on the TV show or, um, uh, and on the radio shows that we do. Well, it's so interesting because, I mean, obviously there's a, a Notre Dame oriented podcast, but I mean, there's a ton of recruiting questions that, that folks have out there. Yeah. But one of the things that, that kind of blows me away, I mean, one, when was the last time Notre Dame had a five-star quarterback commit to Notre Dame? And two, because it's been so I can't even think about who it was, but two, well, why is that an issue? Probably Jimmy Clausen. Jimmy okay. Clausen or Brady Quinn. Okay. Um, but, but that's what? That's almost, what, 15 years ago? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, long a long time, time. ago. You know what it comes down to, and I think they're changing that now. And I hope Tommy Reese is doing it too, and I think he will. You got to recruit these guys, the five stars, for two, 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 three years. Okay. Um, it's no longer one year now. You get, you identify them quickly if they're starting as freshmen, jump on them right away, okay. mainly sophomores, and you okay. and you jump on them like this year. Um, the kid out in California, Notre Dame jumped on him a little bit too late, and he committed to Oklahoma. He's a great five-star quarterback. Um, they got in a, a little bit late with Arch Manning because he had already had LSU and Ole Miss right. offers, and uh, he's a great quarterback too. So you got to identify him and jump on him really quick. I think the kid they got from San Diego that's a freshman at Notre Dame now is going to be very good, but he only had one year. He wasn't a five-star, mainly because he missed the sophomore year due to injuries. Had a great junior year in a private league. He didn't play against the best schools really? in San Diego. And then he missed the last year because of COVID. But he does have the intangibles. He's got the height, the smarts, okay. the, the, the foot speed. He could develop into a great one, but he's not ready okay. made yet. So it's up to Tommy Reese to develop him into a five-star quarterback. Sure. But he certainly has that type of ability. Um, so you're right. That's That's been Notre Dame's downfall. That plus a defensive recruiting. But Marcus Freeman's handling all. Marcus was in my U.S. Army All-American game. He was one of our <laughs> captains in 2005. So I interviewed I gave him five stars as a linebacker. On wow. The and I hadn't talked to him. I just uh, came and saw him a couple months ago when I was in South Bend. And okay. had, hadn't seen him since 2000. So 16 years. And he's done oh great. But he's become a phenomenal recruiter. And um, Notre Dame had always lagged behind defensively since – the great 1990 class, a few years after you, mm -hmm. which was Bryant Young and Jim Flanagan right. and Pete Persich right. and Brian Hamilton and Oliver Gibson, Tom Carter, Jeff Burst, all those great guys. So How do you remember those guys from that class? That's well, amazing. they were all Americans. Uh, they're easy. But there was the great class. They sure. hadn't had anything. That's 21. That's right. 31 years ago. So Notre Dame has not done that well defensively. And I think Marcus is now making the defense even or maybe better than the offense when it bring but it's going to take another year or two because now they have great linebackers. You know, I do the buckets. There's four guys going to be nominated out of the 51, mm. and four of them probably will make the top 16 when wow. we get it cut down because they're that good. So that's Marcus. Mike Elson's done a great job of defensive linemen, but also I think the mentality that Mark's bringing there, you got a young guy like O'Leary who's in his first year as coaching. Mm -hmm. He's now learning under a great recruiter, which is right. smart. Right. Mickens went to school, who's the quarterback coach, went to school with um, – Freeman. So mm -hmm. he's learning now too. Instead of three star players, you go up to the four and five star guys. And that's how you're <laughs> going to win. They're never going to come close to Alabama or at least match Alabama, but you can't come close. And I think in the next two, not, I, I don't see it this year, but I think in the next couple of years, Notre Dame will have a shot, a legit shot at a national title because the defensive players they're bringing in, they've already got some good running backs. Taylor does a great job. Quinn is an outstanding. He brought in two five star offensive linemen last year. And they both may start this year. Right, right. How many offensive uh, freshmen start? I mean, offensive line wise, mm -hmm. McNulty looks like he's doing a good job. So it looks like they're they're uh, they've gotten things going now at Notre Dame. It took Coach Kelly a while to realize, no matter how good of a coach you are, you win with recruiting because sure. Pete Carroll, I'm, on my um, Mount Rushmore of great recruiters, okay. I said this on my TV show uh, a year or so ago. Uh, the guys would be Mac Brown, Pete Carroll, Nick Saban, Bobby Bowden. <laughs> And Urban Meyer. Wow. And then the young guys that are coming close it will be James Franklin, Ed Ogeron, and Dabo will be guys that could be doing it. But they, they got it. They understand that you right. no matter how good of a coach you are, you win with great players. And Pete Carroll said that. He said, hey, no matter how great coach you are, you got to get the impact players. That's what's going to do. Because I asked him about some Southern Cal guys. He goes, 
we're going after number one draft choices, but we'll leave the rest to UCLA and everybody else. We'll go after oh. the number ones around the rest of the country. And before Nick Saban, there was Pete Carroll when it came to great recruiting. Well, I was fortunate enough to have Marcus Friedman on, on, on the podcast. And it was so refreshing, Tom, to kind of hear someone with kind of a different idea, um, different attitude, really, about players. And one of the things, and we're, we're, we're doing this exact same thing, and he was like, well, I'm not going to go after Notre Dame guys anymore. And I was like, well, hold on. And I'm writing it down going, wait, what, wait, wait a minute. You know, you got to be careful what you're saying here because, and he was like, well, Chris, let me explain. And he talked about how he's going to go after the best players in the country and bring them to campus. And then we'll, we'll see after that. And yeah. I thought that was so different. And even though it's so simple, right? Because everybody does that. But back in the day, or even a couple of years ago, there was only a select group of folks that Notre Dame recruited. Yeah. Right? Not everybody, but it's, it's, and it's so interesting. And he talked about how if you're looking for national championships, they've been in the college football playoff the last two years. If you're looking at NFL success, they have more NFL players drafted than any other team in the country. And three, what? And again, I sound like I'm recruiting for Notre Dame now, right? But but this is all what this is what Marcus is talking about. And three is like, I can offer you a world class education. There are Notre Dame Club of Chicago's all over the world. Or excuse me, Notre Dame Club of Notre Dame's all over the world. Yeah. You tell me what what school can offer you that? And it's like, wow. I mean, it's blowing me away how impressed I am that how people are with him. And, and, and they're loving what he's saying. Well, to be honest, it had been lazy recruiting a lot at Notre Dame when, um, mm. when you compare them to the schools that they were trying to emulate, which okay. would have been Alabama, Georgia, Clemson, Ohio State, LSU, and, and sometimes Texas and USC. Those are the schools that Notre Dame would uh, – but they didn't have that oomph, that, that extra effort in recruiting. They felt Notre Dame was going to sell itself. And Notre Dame suffered. Tyrone Williams had a horrible recruiting staff. And Charlie Weiss didn't have a much better class, a staff. And, and Urban didn't either. I mean, Urban, um, uh, Bob Davey didn't either. Mm -hmm. It was, I understood it, but the athletic directors at Notre Dame had no clue uh, about it, even though they should have. That was their job. They should have understand what was going on. Coach Kelly is a real good coach. He understands himself. Sure. So that's why he understands that you got to go after great recruiters. You don't just bring in buddies. You bring, or people are yes men. You bring in right. guys that know how to coach. And look at Nick Saban. He's got a big ego, but his ego is not that big to bring in Lane Kiffin or Steve Sarkeesian or Kevin, uh, right. all these great offensive minds. Sure. Because he knows no matter what happens, if when they win, they're not going to get the credit. It's going right. to be Nick getting the right. credit. <laughs> Lou, Holtz, <laughs> Lou Holtz understood that. Um, everybody would talk about Vinny Serrato doing a great job, recruiting, which he did. Vinny was the reason he got all the great players. But Holtz knew Vinny wasn't going to get much. It was always right. going to be Lou Holtz winning or losing. Sure. And sure. he got it. And once you get it, you want to get out there and you want to bring in the best recruiters possible. And the best move that Kelly's made since he's been at Notre Dame is bringing in Marcus Freeman. Hmm. Well, and it's so interesting because you talked about something that is very simple, but I mean, folks have a hard time listening to this, that Notre Dame isn't selling itself anymore. And that's the thing now, right? I mean, basically every school is on, te is on television now. So yeah. you don't have that aspect of going into somebody's living room and saying, hey, you know, you're from California. You don't have to travel to the games because your son's game is going to be on TV every week. Well, all games are on, on yeah. TV every week. Well, Notre Dame still has NBC, which is uh, uh, one of those massive uh, sure. carriers. But you're right. Uh, they got all their games on, but Notre Dame it still does something special with NBC. And you're right. I remember the old coaches at Notre Dame saying, well, you know, we got bad weather. Ohio State's got the same weather. Penn State's got the same weather. It doesn't really matter when you're out because Notre Dame's got, like you said, the highest graduation rate, the most tradition, a ton of guys that put in the NFL, fantastic facilities, great. You know, the education is second to none. So they got the most to sell. But a lot of times they didn't want to go out and sell. They sold it to the easy three-star guys that always wanted to come to Notre Dame. And that's the reason. You are listening to the Zorch podcast with our guest, Tom Lemming. Um, 
one of the things I like to talk about is the fact that Notre Dame is getting some five, they, they are getting some five-star um, athletes on defense, as you mentioned, Marcus Freeman, um, since Marcus couldn't talk about the person that, that they were able to get, um, hopefully you have a chance to. And I believe it's, it's a kid from Ohio. Um, what was his name? Um, Brennan, I think. Oh, yeah, Brennan, uh, Brennan Vernon. Yes, yes, The yes. defensive end. He fires, they beat Ohio State on him. I went and saw him about a year ago. He was on crutches at the time, but you knew he's got an elite, kind of like a Joey Bosa okay. type build to him. He's got, right. he got elite kind of speed off the ball and a defensive end who's going to keep getting bigger. I think he's about 255 now, but he's going to, but he can run. And that's the key that gave him five stars. And uh, he's a big catch for them for next year. He's only going to be a junior this year in high school. Right, so. right, exactly. So exactly. He's, and that's what I mean. Recruiting him a couple of years ahead of time and just going after the guys. Marcus knew him when he was at Cincinnati, which really helped. Sure. And um, sure. He, they didn't have a shot at Cincinnati like right. Notre Dame would, but he, but he, but he still recruited him, and I think that's a, a key for them. And uh, you know, I was talking about the four linebackers that they're bringing in for next year. Uh, Jalen Sneed, he's got five star potential for sure. He's a kid okay. out of South Carolina. His coach is a friend of mine down at Hilton Head, and I, when I went down there to see him at Thanksgiving. They, him and his mom got in a car accident. I was waiting with the coach and they got in a wow. car accident. And I said, Oh my God, I felt bad. And um, the coach go, no, no, they want to still come and see you. the car got totaled. So they still drove oh, up there The coach picked them up. And I met him. I felt so bad. But he was, he's one of the premier players in South Carolina, massive catch. I know they never would have gotten a kid out of South Carolina without Marcus Freeman. Oh. And then they got the linebacker. Um, I'm still, I've known him for, since his freshman year. Bishop Bell, he's coach. He's played a coach by Casey Clausen, Jimmy Clausen's uh, older brother. Okay, okay. Uh, and Bishop Bellamini, but he's a, a tough inside backer, a guy who's got real good straight head speed, not as flexible as the other three. And the other two that came out of Michigan are outstanding. One's playing strong safety, he was all state, but he's going to be a linebacker. And the other kid is uh, a terrific all around athlete. So he got some great players there. Wow. And that's so encouraging, Tom, because. I mean, and seeing what 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 you not only what you know, but more importantly, kind of the relationship that you you have with these individuals, in the fact that they're able to say, okay, hey, this is the place where I want to go, and I know nothing signed in, in, in yeah. signed stone yet, but the idea that it's helping Notre Dame, it's helping. I mean, when you start signing good guys, other guys want to be a part of it, which I think is amazing. That's that's what started with Vinny Serrato. Uh, and, and the year, I think, um, the year, right after yours, your class was real good, and it was top five, I think. Then he got four number ones in a row following you, including with that great class that had five number one draft choices right. in the 1990 class. Right. And um, so I know I think your class might have been uh, – your class was a number one, see, because they had four in a row. Alabama's had eight out of nine number ones, so it's awfully tough. But uh, uh, Vinny knew it, and he writes, great players want to play with great players. So right. once you get the ball rolling, which is what Mark is doing on defense, you need that going on offense now, too, to bring in these legit uh, great players like a quarterback. They bring in it two finally, because I always thought they had done poorly with wide receivers. They had big, strong guys. They got lucky with the kid from Canada who's now doing well with the Steelers. Right. But he, right. Wasn't, a national, he wasn't right. a national recruit. Mm -hmm. But now I think the easiest position to recruit is wide receiver because they're everywhere. And I think they're bringing in two really good guys for this year. There's a kid named Styles that I love in Columbus as a punt returner, kick returner. Okay. And then a kid from Athens, Georgia, who I really liked a lot. And then next year. Yeah, I think I lost you for a second time. Yeah, I, yeah okay. Good. There we go. So you're saying uh, next year? Next year they're going to have the class. Next year is going to be better than this class. Mm. That's so good. But this class coming in for um, this December that'll be signed is going to be right. Uh, right now. Some people have ranked number one. Definitely, it's a top two or three class. Okay. And, and they're still going after other players. So I'd like to see. Um, it, it, Kelly said last year that they were going to change things up, and they did. The key thing was Marcus Freeman, but also I think Kelly's getting more involved with players. As a head coach, he's got to keep pace with Oklahoma or LSU right. when it comes to going, especially with quarterbacks. And Kelly's the guy. Kelly's the offensive guy. He's the right. he's the head coach. And if he can work on a guy when he identifies him as a sophomore, but you know, call him every month or just make mm -hmm. sure that you, you can't call him, but 
uh, here's the story. Remember Leonard Fournette, the running back in the yeah, NFL? Yeah. I was sitting in New Orleans with Leonard and his coach. He was finishing up his sophomore year, and I was watching film okay. with the, the three of us. During the two hours I was there, Lane Kiffin called from USC, Nick Saban from Alabama, and Les Miles from LSU. Those wound up two years later being the three schools that he wound up as the wow. final three. They had been calling wow. him since his sophomore year. Wow. They, he, they called the coach who then tells Leonard, you got to call these guys every week because they can't directly call them. But if right. Leonard calls right. them, that's how they get them. And that's smart. And Coach Kelly has enough cachet now, a name that all the big names in the country are going to want to talk to him. Okay. Okay. Well, and it's also interesting because one of the things that when, when Marcus was on, I was talking to him and I was saying, hey, this is crazy. Oklahoma, they went, they, they had a recruiting weekend. They went and brought in all these cars and everything. And that's crazy. He's like, well, Chris, actually, it's not. I mean, that's what we need to start to do because we need to bring these kids here. Then we can sell them. And I'm like, oh, my God, like, I, I haven't heard that. Like, this is it's so encouraging. Though. I was I've been doing that for years when I talked to some schools, not just Notre Dame, but other ones that don't. I said, have a junior day. All the top juniors in the country that could come to maybe your North Carolina game, just juniors. Right. That's it. So they they're in the same class. They get to know each other. They could walk around the campus together. They could they could really mold themselves into one unit before they even commit. Normally, each class has a guy, a quarterback that'll work with guys. Okay. Um, this year, Notre Dame's got a quarterback from New Jersey who is very personable. I've known him since his freshman year from Bergen Catholic, and he's been calling kids and working on offensive guys too. And you do need that, but I think bringing them in as many times, and that was always that's Saban's philosophy, that was Urban's. The more, the more you can get them on the campus, the more likely you are to land them, mm -hmm. get them familiar not only with coaching staff, but the students, the faculty, right. the, the cafeteria people. Get them right. to know everybody. And they'll feel more comfortable and they'll want to go to that school. Well, it, it's so interesting because you, you mentioned before there's some rankings that have that, that has Notre Dame ranked number one, number two for the 2022 class. I mean, can you talk a little bit about, and I don't not go over every player, but I mean, what's going to make a difference right now between, let's say, like the number one Notre Dame? And right now, I think Alabama is like seventh or something like that. Yeah, they'll bounce up. But they I was going to say, but it, toward the end of it, they're going to get the last minute guys. They're going to get people that are still holding out. I was doing radio shows in Birmingham and Mobile last year when Alabama was ranked 63rd. But it was early. And the fans were ready. Oh, get rid of Nick Saban's losing. It isn't. Then he winds up with the greatest class of all time. What people right. saying. Right. And that's how, because the fans, the fans are just, um, I'm not really in tune a lot of times with what's sure. going on. Sure. It's the, the race always goes to the tortoise, not the hare. Mm. And when it comes to recruiting, the great mm. players, the top 50, the majority of them will wait till the end of the year. Right. And then make their announcement. That's when all this Alabama, Ohio State, Clemson pile right in there and start getting them. So even if Notre Dame is top five, that's all that really matters because it's all um, apples and oranges anyway. It's, it's so uh, subjective that you don't really know. Um, and it's my, I think they're number one, or this guy thinks they're number one. Right. And um, you, can, you can't really, it, it, like I said, as long as you're getting great players, that's all that really matters. And and some of these ratings, are, I, this guy's got this many points, or this guy's got this point. That, that doesn't mean, that means nothing. I mean, just right. points. How do you give the guy points when they don't play against each other? Right. They exactly. don't even see each other. You got a guy in California getting more points than a guy in Florida. They have no idea who they are. Watching, mm. you know, but I think it's, it's a way they go. And, and, and like I said, it's an inexact science. So you've got to do it some way. And I guess sure. that's as good as any. Sure. So when you're watching games now, college games, when you're watching um, the the college football playoffs, I mean, are you thinking, hey, so, so for example, let's take a look at their end, right? So the last two years, they've, they did not do well. When you're watching those games, are you able to say, okay, hey, I know that in two more years they're going to get X, they're going to get this guy? Or are you looking more kind of at immediate help? Because at the end of the day, I, mean, I really have the feeling that if they keep doing what they're doing, folks aren't going to vote for them anymore. Yeah, you know, um, I was watching the Notre Dame Bowl game in uh, Garland, Texas with one of my – Co-host, he used to nut. He used to be the head coach of Arkansas and Ole Miss. So we're at a um, uh, Papa Do's restaurant with okay. Cajun food. And then we had the big screens there and we're watching Notre Dame. And Houston is a guy I really uh, admire. And I, and I 
always want to know his advice and whatever he has to say, because I thought he was a great coach. Okay. And um, he was talking about it was like a man among boys when when they're playing Clemson for the second time. Right. And you could see the lack of depth more than talent. Sure. Okay. And they didn't okay. have that depth. And um, especially on the defensive side of the ball, all of a sudden a cornerback and the first and cornerback goes on, all of a sudden, that's it. Right. You know, right. They had no right. depth and they didn't have a lot of speed at wide receiver. Uh, and Notre Dame could beat almost everybody in the country, but there are about six or seven schools you need to be comparable with talent-wise, speed-wise, athletic ability-wise to beat them. And sure. it's been proven with Ohio State, Alabama, Clemson, whenever they play them, that Notre Dame is not on that par. But believe me, and this is good for your fans, it, it's going to be that way in another year or two. Notre Dame mm -hmm. now is starting to get some great players. This is different than what it had been before. They've always been top 15. But right. now it's different. The way they're recruiting, they're going after the elite players. And now if a guy brings in a three-star, he's done a lousy job. Right, <laughs> right. exactly. Three -star was, exactly. was sort of the limit. That was his kind thing. of the norm, right? Hey, we got that three-star <laughs> cornerback from Maryland. Now, oh. now they're going after the four- and five-star guys, and it's becoming more the norm than it is the exception. Well, it's just so painful to kind of hear that because that was the norm, and that was acceptable, right? I mean, hey, oh, yeah. and, and, and again, I'm not – I don't even know if they had like a ranking when 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 I came out. So I don't put the value in the, the, these rankings, right? Because it, it it all depends on what happens when you get there on the field. Because yeah. there were guys that I played with that you know. I mean, I'm not going to name names, but who came in as great players and never saw the field. Yeah. Well, that's always going to be like that, Chris. There's some guys that looked the part. And some, and then you project them with more of a star or a rating. Sure. I've done that too. I've made mistakes when a guy looks fantastic, and right. you're thinking this guy's going to dominate the way he can run. And, right. But then they get on the football field, and they just don't have that oomph. A lot of kids use the scholarship as a, a means to an end, meaning an education, which isn't bad. But there's other guys that want both. They want to be great football players and right. great students, right. and those are the guys that you kind of look for. But that's why I believe I go see the kids and. In person, I sit down with them and I try to find out how important football is to them. Sure. Not just, okay, you had 140 tackles last year. You had five interceptions. You had 10 right. interceptions. But how important is it to you to get to you – know, now, a lot of schools, like Alabama has used that philosophy for years. I don't know about academics with them, but I do know that everybody they go after has that eye. The reason they choose Alabama right. is because Alabama is putting so many players into right. the NFL. Right. Georgia the same way, Clemson the same way. Mm -hmm. None of them have the academic reputation of a Notre Dame. Right. Uh, Notre Dame could get the both, best of both worlds if they recruit that way and just right. say, hey, you know, we want the guys that are going to fight to the end, guys that have that heart like you did. I mean, there were very few Chris Zorches ever to play at Notre Dame. And the reason was you weren't the tallest guy around or the fastest you were just the best because you desire your desire was to be the best, and you were. I mean, when you look at defensive tackles, none of them look like you. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. That 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 is a hundred percent true. Yes. I mean, you true. how tall are you? Like five eleven, six foot. If hopefully on a good day, yes. Yeah. Exactly, see, exactly. and that's what I mean. And so, I I remember when um, I was talking to one of the Notre Dame coaches at the time. You were playing linebacker, and they said, "Well." Chris is starving himself to stay around 230. And all of a sudden, we just told him, we don't know if he's going to be big enough. And then went, in one month, you're like 260. I said, hey, seriously. And, and everybody's like, oh, you're taking steroids. You're taking steroids. And I'm like, first of all, I can't afford steroids. I mean, yeah. it's not even, that was a part of it. But you're right, Tom. And that's funny. I remember like going and there was all this beautiful, wonderful food. It was a lot better than, than what, what we had at home. I mean, we oh, sure. didn't have a lot at home. And I'm eating salads. Tom, it was ridiculous. <laughs> the stand linebacker. Ridiculous. Just to stand up. And I was, I mean, I was probably like the eighth, ninth team linebacker. And then I don't know if you remember uh, um, Tim Ryan from yeah, Kansas, Kansas City. City. Right. So he was a linebacker as well. They moved him to guard. He started at guard. I mean, it's literally, when you think about the, the people that Holtz brought in or Vinny brought in, they knew what they were doing. They were moving people. Todd White was a receiver. Oh, yep. Jeff Burris was a tailback. Um, Tom Carter was a quarterback. And, you know, um, the best ever at that was Eric Parsegian, who won really? national titles. He he recruited all quarterbacks because he felt they were the best athletes on the field. So he would put quarterbacks at linebacker. He put them in, wow. drop, in the secondary wide receiver. A lot of his top guys were – he did that. He came in 
um, uh, Arrow was on my show about four years ago okay. before he passed. Uh -huh. And he talked about a thing called the jumbo backfield when he first got to Notre Dame from Northwestern. Okay. He had two 260-pound tailbacks in the backfield. They, and they would get two or three yards in a cloud of dust. They didn't get very far. Oh he God. moved them both, and they both had 10-year NFL careers to end the defensive oh. line. And he did that. He did that. Con and he had John Ewart was, I think, six-string quarterback. Mm -hmm. Jack Snow, who became an all-pro with the Rams, was a, uh, was a tailback, a halfback. Oh. And he did a concert. He had a guy named John Pergine who was a quarterback in high school. Tommy Shane, who was a quarterback. They're all on defense. So Arrow was good. And Lou Holtz, I think, really admired Arrow Parsegian. and I know he picked his brain a lot. And Lou did a lot of that changing. You were one of the guys that changed position. But like you said, there were an awful lot of guys on that team that did. There were, and that's what... I think it was interesting because what all what another aspect of the success that we had, um, I think, were a lot of the players that were with Faust, and they literally had and they were there were some great players there, but the the coaching just wasn't there. No, and then you had this combination of these young kids who didn't know the the recent history of Notre Dame. And you had these guys who had suffered the 58-7 to zero, or 58 seven loss to Miami. You, you had the embarrassing games, the, the, the locker room dissension. Yeah. All of things are working out. And then Holtz mixed us together. And I mean, he was he won a national championship in his third year. That's crazy. He knew what he was doing. And Elu Holtz had great success, even at Minnesota, limited success because it's Minnesota. Mm -hmm. But he had great success at Arkansas and um, obviously um, – didn't have great success in the pros because right. I don't think anybody listened to him there. <laughs> exactly. He had success exactly. at Exxon State. Server Holtz has been, he had, he had real good success because he understood college football and understood what it took to win. He had the same philosophy. Uh, he wasn't, he was great in the house in recruiting. The problem was getting him to the house. Sure. I don't think, I think sure. he'd rather golf than recruit. Right. And I think if he had done, because I, Vinny told me this one story when the great class of 1990, I don't think Colts made one home visit before signing day except. Jerome Bettis wow. was thinking of switching to Bo Schembechler in Michigan. Okay. So I remember Vinny said he called Holtz and he said, you got to get up to Detroit. He goes, can't you guys do anything yourselves? Wow. <laughs> he, had, he didn't take any visits at all. To, oh, my He God. went up and saved the day with Bettis and, and Jerome came and the rest is history. But when Holtz, I, I sat in once with um, one of the players in Chicago with Lou Holtz when he first got the job, his very first day on the job recruiting okay. in uh, December of 85. And, uh, I was amazed. He was doing magic tricks. He knew everything about Notre Dame. He had just come from Minnesota. He was like, uh, he had that great mind where he could pick up things. I think he grew up as a Notre Dame fan anyway. Right, he, he did. He, he did, knew yeah. it. And the parents were sold completely. The ball player, I think, was listening a little bit, but the parents were the one, the reason why that player went to Notre Dame. Wow. Because if you remember, his first class, he had 10 guys from Chicago. Uh, well, class Tom, seriously. So. I mean, you think, and then I think five of them were from St. Lawrence alone. <laughs> And if they hadn't gotten involved with some of the substances, they would have been all stayed there. But. Well, well, that and also, I think, and it was so interesting, it was like some crazy stat were like, all these kids came from Chicago, but uh, and like after like the summer, uh, going into the year, they were all like, half of them were, were kicked out. It was crazy. <laughs> I but, but, but it was so interesting because Holtz was bringing this, this different type of player. Tough guys. Tough guys. I know right. Yeah, well, here's here's part of that story. Look, they brought in 10 guys from Chicago. All 10 went on a visit to um, Illinois with Billy Callahan, who's still a good friend of mine. Billy okay. later became head coach of the Raiders in Nebraska. So I get a call from Billy at like 6 in the morning. And they and they had obviously been – nobody committed to close to signing day back in those days. Okay. So Billy called and he goes, ah, you're not going to believe what happened. I go, what happened? He goes, I had all the kids down there and uh, – uh, Zaleski, I guess they're drinking beer or something. And John Zaleski punched Jeff Alm in the face. Jeff wasn't one of the Catholic leaguers. All nine, including Kevin McShane from Joliet Catholic, right. came from three schools Joliet Catholic, St. Lawrence, and St. Rita. Right. Jeff came from uh, Sandburg. Sandburg, yep. And, and Jeff was a real nice kid. And uh, But he got, he wanted to be like one of the guys. So, and they were getting, the, the Rita guys, I think, were drinking a little too much. And they got up and they went out and fought. And one punch, Zaleski broke uh, Jeff Alm's nose. He's bleeding all over. He calls three in the morning. Calls Callahan. I'm gonna go home. 
and Billy had to drive him all the way back to us uh, at Sauerland Park. Jeez. And uh, I remember I called Zaleski. What's the, what's the matter with you? I, I, Zaleski, Zaleski was one of the great players. Matter of fact, I put him on the USA Today team as a punter. He had like mm. almost a 50-yard average punting. Mm. He was a tough – he would have been in the NFL as an offensive guard for years. And guess what? Once he got caught, I think I think it was an academic problem, a uh, uh -huh. TV or something, he got booted along with Jason Zagelski, who was smart enough to go to Purdue and become all Big Ten. John wow. was better than him. John went and became a uh, carpenter. Wow. He just left football. He would have been one of the great players in that group, but maybe, uh. you know, you know, they had gotten into some problems at Notre Dame. Jeff Pearson, Paul Glanick. Mm -hmm. Mike Harrison was another great one. Right. Yeah. That yeah. Ten group, but he had some problems coming out of Lawrence. He was a straight mm -hmm. A student. So yeah. I think he graduated from Notre Dame, but never played. Right. Do, right. You, do you remember Mike there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I had seen him all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And I grew up across the street from Stan Smagala's dad. So I knew the Smagala's. I was the one I had it, asked him, you know, where do you want to go to camps? And then they had both called me up. Um, Holtz came in and told him that he didn't want. Stan was the only guy committed from that 85. Exactly. And he goes, uh, we're going to honor it, Stan, but we don't um, – want you at Notre Dame. You're never going to play here. Exactly. You're not good enough. So then the Smagala parents got on a three-way phone with me. I called me at home. I says, you got no place to go. So just hold out. Holtz is not going to dump a kid. Wow. It gives horrible publicity right in the beginning. Right. Right. Said, and eventually Faust offered him at Akron, but that wasn't uh, mm -hmm. enticing enough. So I said, just stay out and prove him wrong. I, I knew he could run, but he was awfully small, 155 pounds at the time. And he wound up being an All-American in Notre Dame and helping you guys win the national title. And Holtz apologized to him later, saying, I made a big mistake even right. telling you that. Because you know what? They saw a little white kid playing corner, sure. and they said he's not going to be able to play. And right. that's really what happened. George Kelly right. had offered him. Falls came in and didn't want to honor it, but they had to because of the bad publicity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's and it's interesting because it's those stories that you think about. It's like, wow, what if Stan wasn't there? You know, yeah. do do we win the 1988 USC game? I mean, he single-handedly got the interception, scored. I mean, he, he, he had a phenomenal game. So you think about kind of – you hear those recruiting stories, and you're like, oh, my God, I'm so, I'm so glad it, it turned out that way, you know? You know, did you like Jeff Alm? Was he a good guy? He yeah, 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 he was good, yeah, yeah. And, you know, Jeff was a different kind of guy, and um, I always felt bad. Remember we went uh, with Frank Eck to that Cub game? Yeah. After, after you guys are gone. Yep. Yep. And, and Mirko was with us at Foley. Yeah. Um, I can't, uh, Lindsay, your yeah. fighting yeah. buddy. And <laughs> remember, we met Jeff Alm at Soldier Field when we were all getting on. He was, Frank was getting off his plane. Uh -huh. And uh, we sh I, 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 I still kick myself now since Jeff has passed away. Right. We didn't invite him to come with us. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I know he was asking us. And he could have gone to the game right. because um, Frank, uh, Paul Maneri was the baseball coach, and, and he yeah. was good friends with. Jim Henry, the Cubs general manager, and I, I, I just felt really bad about that. And uh, wow. uh, and Jeff was a nice kid. See, I knew I helped his older brother get to um, Western Kentucky on a scholarship. Well, you know, okay, I didn't know that. Wow. His brother Lance, Lance Elm. So the mom had called me, and Lance had no offers. So mm. Dave Roberts, who eventually went to Notre Dame as office coordinator, was head coach of West Kentucky, one of my real good friends. Okay. So um, I called Dave up and I told him uh, there was a running back at, at uh, Notre Dame years before too named Ray Carter from 81. Okay. And I got Ray's brother and I got J Lance Elm to go. I gave Dave, gave him full rides in West Kentucky. They both wound up being starters. Wow. So then Lance's mother called me up because after he got broken, his nose broken, he wanted to go to UCLA. But the mom, I think, wanted him at Notre Dame. And she called me up and I talked to him. I said, you know. I said, how often are you going to see Zagelski? Yeah, probably had a practice against him. Yeah, right, right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, you know, and it's interesting, Tom, and, and, and I mean, we're, we're going to wrap up a little bit, but it's – what I hear are relationships, yeah. right? And so to you, I get the sense, and I mean, I was there, right? I mean, so I mean, I, I was one of your one, one of your early, early pupils, so to speak, right? Because – my mom called you, I talked to you, and this is way beyond after I committed, and we've had this relationship over the years, right? So when I think of other people in the business, I look at them as just kind of looking at names on a stat sheet yeah. versus you, you and, and again, I can attest to it, you have relationships with these kids. And so I can't imagine the thousands of relationships 
that you've had over the years, but more importantly, the individuals, the kids, the families that you've helped get scholarships. Yeah, I had a lot of them. Yours was different, though. I always thought you were a different, you were a, a, a one in a million type of a kid. And I always, so you, you were, and plus your situation, Zora would call me at times, talk, but not only about you, but her, her brother was uh, Louis Zorch, an actor. Yeah. Yeah. I always like, now I know so many actors. You know, I'm to you guys, but I was always enthralled that Lippy the Caucus was your right. aunt right. and right. stuff like that. And uh, she would talk about uh, him and the acting. And uh, so I remember I, he was in, uh, what, what movie? Uh, the one where he played a Russian constable. Yeah. Oh, gosh, I forgot. I never uh, seen the movie. But yes, so, yeah. Yeah. so I went to see it because your mom told me to go see that. <laughs> but, and but, I, but, I, I rented but the Tom, movie. That's what I'm talking about, though. I mean, these are relationships that you have with these kids. And even, and I was just kind of joking around before about kind of having a, a bad pick or giving a bad ranking, but outside of the ranking, the, the stats, I mean, you you care about these kids. And I oh, think yeah. that's what's great. And even the ones who you're able to assist with scholarships, I mean, think about the opportunities that these kids have because you are willing to kind of step in and help out. I mean, for a lot of these kids, I'm sure they may be the first person in their family to go to college. And you were able to kind of help them do that. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And I've enjoyed doing it too. And there's, um, I'm, I, you're right. I'm getting parents now that I knew back in the uh, early 80s, through the 80s with their sons, Brad sure. Foss being one of them. Remember Brad wow, Foss? Yeah, absolutely. And Brad's out in, in the uh, stock market in New Jersey. So I had his son last year. And, and then his brother, Kevin Kloss, who wound up also. And you do a lot of the Chicago guys. And uh, you eventually wind up Mike Allstead with his son. That's how I got back to see Mike again after his son was a quarterback in uh, St. Petersburg. And so you get to see a lot of the guys. Uh, Randy Moss, I discovered Randy. Uh, he was already local, locally known in Charleston. Okay. But I was with Pittsburgh. And um, I was watching film at the University of Pittsburgh with the coaches. Okay. And I had my son with me. He was like six years old at the time. And we were there. And, I, and they go, hey, you're looking at all these kids here. There's a kid three miles south, three hours south of here that's better than all of them. Randy was a sophomore at the time. So I actually was, I said, I got to go check this guy. We got time. And my son and I were doing a lot of this sightseeing. I was taking him on history tours. Okay. So we went down to see Randy. And with me, Randy was all right because, you know, he was a surly kid. He didn't like a lot of adults or people. Okay. But I got to know him and I talked to him. So the next day I told Dave Carter, USA Today, I just saw the best player in the country and he's only a sophomore. So that blows him up. So then Randy trusts me and he talks to me for the next couple of years. Okay. And I knew he was going to Notre Dame, but he asked me not to say anything because he, right. he had announced the month before that. He told them, which caused Notre Dame a problem because – Dave Roberts, again, was now the offense coordinator. David called me the night before and said, Javon Kirst just committed to Notre Dame, the great player from Florida, right. North Fort Myers. Right. So that was, but then the next morning, Notre Dame had two scholarships left. One was going to Moss, so they're not going to play with that one. Right. So then there was a battle between Joe Moore with this kid named Mueller. Joe, one of Joe's pupil, who's Biff Poggi now, a coach in St. Francis, Baltimore, okay. had a kid named Mueller, offensive lineman. Okay. And there was a battle between him and Dave to get Javon Kirsten and Mueller won. <laughs> so Javon, wow. Dave, Dave Roberts said he had to tell Javon they couldn't take him. He went on to Florida to become a perennial all pro in the pros. Oh my God. That was already a number one class with Randy Moss and uh, Corey Miner and all these. Right. Mike Rosenthal and all these great guys. Imagine if they had Javon Kirsten in that class. But oh my God. I'll give you one more example because the best recruiter ever at Notre Dame was Vinny Serrato. But he did have a guy. Vinny and I, I knew Vinny at Minnesota when he was a GA. Okay. And then, uh, so I talked to him when he first got the recruiting coordinator job in Minnesota, came to Notre Dame. He was only a recruiting coordinator for a few months before he got to Notre Dame. Right. But he had been on a roll getting all these great players and everything else. And I had gone, I was friends with the coach at Fairview High School in Boulder. And he okay. had a big tackle named Tony Baselli, who was very good. Notre Dame had offered him, everybody offered him. So Vinny's on the, um, he, Vinny, uh, tells me it's taking someone else and he's i just can't i just don't like him he's too skinny and he turned down tony baselli now there's an even better story because there's a kid named bob whitfield the national player of the year when yeah, yeah. offensive lineman he went to stanford right uh exactly but yeah. you know where he wanted to go so Vinny calls me one time it was during the great class you were at notre dame at the time because there was a linebacker named nick smith coming yeah 
Nick had committed to Notre Dame. Yeah. But I remember a couple of days before that, Vinny called me and said, Nick Smith wants to visit UCLA, and he's telling me that he's going to go no matter what and this and that. Because at that year, I think you're still allowed 30 guys. And that was okay. Nick was the 30th, so they were kind of full. So okay. then Vinny calls, and he goes, I get a call from Bob Whitfield and his high school coach saying, Bob wants to commit to Notre Dame right there on the phone. Vinny called me. Guess what? He goes, you're not going to believe it. Bob Whitfield, the National Player of the Year, calls and says, I go, you took him, didn't he? He goes, I told him we ran out. I go, Nick Smith just told you he wants to go to UCLA. Here's a linebacker who's good, but he's not the number one player in the country. Right, then, he, right. then he called back, and by that time, they had already called Stanford, and um, that was it. But I ran into Bob Whitfield at UCLA, where I had a big picture thing about six years ago, and okay. he had his son there, and I asked. The whole story was true. Bob goes, I was devastated. <sighs> we called up Notre Dame, and they turned us down. Wow. Bob was a straight-A student. He was, he was a good student. Oh. Stanford took him, too. But sometimes, and it was still uh, maybe a month before the end of recruiting. There's so much that could be jostled about. Right. With sure, 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 sure. And, so, and the reason I bring it up, because Vinny made very few mistakes. I mean, mm -hmm. he was a guy that plucked out Tom Carter and plucked out guys that not a people weren't crazy about until mm. he offered them. But he did have that Bob Whitfield mistake. <laughs> That's he's amazing. Kill me if he hears, he's going to kill me if he hears it because I do his radio show still. He hears the story. But oh, that's, that's great. Whitfield. And then the only two mistakes I've seen on Vinny were Bisselli and Whitfield, two offenses. Wow. That is that is absolutely amazing. Tom, this has been terrific. And, and really, I want people to get a sense of when, when they watch the show to really understand that recruiting is all about numbers, height, weight, speed, everything else. But you bring a different aspect to it because you bring that human side. And again, I can attest to it because you were there for me. And that was 35 years ago, something like that. And you're, you're still doing it. And, and that's what, that's why I wanted to do on the show because I wanted people to kind of get a sense of when you look at an individual, it's not just height and weight for you. Oh yeah. You know, it's, um, it's a passion I have, and I, and I I feel obliged, and it's my um, duty to try to help people because I've I've made a great living out of it. I've enjoyed it immensely. That's why I'm still doing it, and uh, I feel like I got to pay back and try to help as many people as as I can. That's why when people call me, I never turn anybody down. I try to help them and connect them with the right people. Sometimes it works. Sometimes they're just not sure. that good. But right. at least I'll give it a shot. <laughs> right. But I feel right. I feel it's my obligation to do that. And I'm glad to do it too. And I still, uh, I have the same passion now that I did when I was 22 years old when oh, I started. So hopefully I'll keep going. Amazing. One day I'll die driving off a cliff in Utah. Because you want to the top. <laughs> I got, I'll just drive, I'll be 90 years old and driving off a cliff this afternoon. Oh my made, gosh. The, made the wrong turn one last time. Oh my gosh. That is absolutely, Tom, this has been absolutely terrific. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. I'd like to thank everyone watching and listening to this episode of the Zorch Podcast, Conversations with Leaders and Legends. This podcast, along with our other podcasts, you can check out on my YouTube page at youtube.com slash chriszorch50, as well as on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my YouTube page and hit the bell to get notified when we have uh, new shows coming out. Also check out the description below as we have books from Amazon by folks who've been on the podcast like Joe Montana, Lou Holtz, Jerome Bettis, and others. Tom, this has been great. Thank you so much, and go Irish. Yeah, my pleasure, Chris. Take care. <laughs> All right, buddy. Thanks a lot. Bye.